What's up and welcome to the final summary review for the 2024 Asus TUF A16. This has the Ryzen 9 7940H X, not to be confused with the HS, the HX version having 16 cores, 32 threads, the HS version being much more battery friendly and only eight cores, 16 threads. So this has an RTX 4070, a QHD plus display, which means 2560 by 1600 resolution, 165 Hertz refresh rate, G-Sync enabled with advanced Optimus, giant thumbs up. And we have a nice full size keyboard, a uh, large number pad. There's so much to love about this laptop right now on sale for 1619. I would not be surprised if we have better sales in this laptop in the future, bringing it down to 1500. But at 1619, this is almost the very best CPU performance per dollar that money can buy out of every single laptop on the entire market. Um, so if you're after multi-core rendering performance, with a 16 core 32 thread CPU, this is one of the cheapest entries into that level of performance. Getting close to, we did get more than 34,000 in Cinemage R23 with this laptop today, but that was the first run. So it's kind of, you know, the best run with the least uh, thermal throttling. Anyway, we're gonna get into all of the details in this final summary review. Let's do it. Okay, so I just gave you the biggest pros and cons. This thing is, Phenomenal CPU value for your money, while at the same time not being too heavy, only 4.89 pounds for the laptop itself. Under five pounds, 16 inch display is phenomenal. We also had 430 nits brightness on that display. That's excellent. Uh, and then the only downside here, color gamut was 100% sRGB, but only about 84% DCI-P3 color gamut. So if you're after video editing, uh, graphic design, that kind of work. Uh, it's not gonna be as colorful as the more expensive laptop displays out there. And there, of course, there are some laptops that are even cheaper than this with better quality displays as well. But those laptops are not gonna have the same CPU performance that this one does. And I did go over five different competitors in the full live stream. So go back to the top deals value comparison if you want to check out those uh, competitive options. Overall, the biggest cons to this laptop it's just, it's it's a bit larger. It doesn't have maybe as good a port selection. The speakers are not as good as well. The webcam, there's no Windows Hello and the webcam quality, not that great. So the ports, let's talk ports for a moment. No Thunderbolt 4, because this is a Ryzen chip, but also no USB 4, which is kind of the equivalent. So no super high speed USB 4. Uh, there is USB-C power delivery and the two USB ports do support Display Port as well as G-Sync support. So those are two giant thumbs up, but yeah, I don't know what the power delivery level is. I'm guessing at least 100 watts. Removing the bottom was pretty dang easy. Uh, not too many screws. There were Phillips head screws as well, but you'll need a piece of plastic to pry apart everything. There is a pop-up screw, so that one screw does not come out. It actually lifts the corner of the chassis up to make it easy to take it apart. There is a free M.2 slot. If you want to slap another SSD in this guy, you don't have to, to remove the existing one terabyte SSD, which was also very fast in our Crystal Disk Mark test, 4.8, uh, 4.8 thousand megabytes per second. Read and speed was a 2.8 okay For your money, I mean, it's a, it's not a bad SSD and it's not gonna be a problem at all uh, unless you're moving like absolutely huge files all the time. Cause then you might want to get a little bit faster SSD. Not many options in the BIOS. You're not gonna really need to go into the BIOS much with this laptop. Uh, there is a couple of overclocking, uh, overclocking options, but I've not messed with that at all but uh, you might be able to use some overclocking with the UXTU. You can do some curve optimizer, which is basically like undervolting for the CPU, but be careful doing that stuff because it does potentially affect your laptop. I would definitely advise caution and only recommend it for advanced users. Bloatware, this had McAfee and it was constantly popping up uh, telling me my subscription was expired and my computer is in danger and it's just a scam. All laptop manufacturers need to stop putting antivirus on their systems, or at least 
At the very least, if there's antivirus installed, it needs to be mandatory that they're never popping up and like demanding subscription fees from users. Uh, and they're never, you know, if it's installed in there, it shouldn't run. Like the moment the subscription runs out, why is it even running? Why is it bothering the user? Like, come on, if the user wants the protection, they can get the protection on their own if they want it. Users just need to be smart with what they download and they're usually good. Windows protection is pretty good if the user is smart about what they bring onto their system. Keyboard and mouse. Very nice keyboard, full size with a number pad, lots of functionality here. The main thing that's lacking with it is there's no FN lock feature to be able to switch the FN, like F1 through 12 keys to the secondary function on the fly. Uh, I really like being able to make like display brightness or volume up and down, all those stuff, mute as the primary function instead of the secondary functions. Makes it easier to do those things, especially if you need to do it a lot. Overall, the keyboard feels nice. It's got a soft rubber feel, not too much travel, but it's decent. I think a lot of people will like typing on this uh, without issue. Now, the chassis itself, very rigid in our, our, on our, our bend test. Uh, not much flex. Honestly, the touchpad is the flexiest part of the, the system. And uh, the trackpad, as far as I can tell, is, is glass. It feels smooth. I don't have any issues with the trackpad. It is large and it clicks okay. It, the main issue with, I guess, if there is an issue with the trackpad, it's just that, like I said, it's softer feeling and more bendy. More bendy than your average trackpad. Laptop control software, Armory Crate, I think is really good. We've got a lot of different options in there for manual fan modes. You can set your fan profile curves so that you can ramp and set exactly how loud you want your laptop to be. Uh, you can switch, quick switch between those uh, fan profiles with the F5 key and the FN key. And uh, the different profiles landed in the usable range in fan noise. Now the fan noise, in my opinion, is a bit on the like motory sound. I think you're hearing the fan motors or we are hearing the fan motors kind of wind up in max fan mode. And I think it's a little bit louder in that sense. 58.9, 59 decibels basically um, is pretty loud for a max fan. Less whooshy than most laptops and not quite as acoustically nice to listen to. And it might bother some people out there but mainly this was only an issue in max fan mode, which is how we tested all of our games today. Uh, under typical workloads, it is much quieter. So max fan mode, 59 decibels. Turbo was right around 53 to 54 decibels. Uh, performance mode, very good performance for only 44 decibels in a 42 decibel base room. Silent mode, not much more additionally silent at 43.5 decibels. So in general, if you're after a quiet, high performance experience, I recommend the performance mode. And if you're after the ultra performance, but still reasonable sound quality, go for turbo or set your own manual fan curves rather than doing max fans. Cause it, the temps on the laptop were actually still pretty good in the mid seventies or high sixties in almost all of the different fan profiles. The only times we saw high temps was in CPU only heavy workloads where we saw the Ryzen chip jump up to the 95 degree uh, threshold where it does thermal throttle at 95 degrees Celsius. So that's the main, I think, downside to the laptop's cooling system. But at the same time, 95 degrees Celsius is still within safe operating temperatures for extended periods of time. I would not be concerned about that. The main downside is that you're not getting the max possible performance from the Ryzen chip because we did set the power limit to 135, but because it is thermal throttling down, it means that it reduces the power going through the CPU down to about 116 watts instead of 135 watts, which then also reduces our boost clock on the CPU from like 4.8 or 4.9 down to like 4.5 gigahertz or so. Still, it's very good performance and you're still getting about 95% of the possible performance of the CPU, even though it is thermal throttling. All of that said, the CPU performance was still outstanding. Over 33,000 in Cinemage R23 consistently, a 10 minute run, 33.2K, which is just nuts. It's such a high CPU score for only a $1,600 laptop. It does not really get better than that from a CPU points per dollar perspective or much better than that, especially considering you're at the peak of what CPU points 
you can get in the first place. So you're getting peak value for your money and you're getting peak performance. And it's super rare to have peak value and peak performance be in the same laptop. And that's really, I think, what makes the Asus Tough A16 unique and an interesting proposition for those of you that need high amounts of CPU cores and want a lot of threads, virtual machines, running tons of different apps at the same time, needing to render video while doing something else in Photoshop, running a background game server while you still want a game with good performance on the other course. You know, there's all kinds of different potential applications for so many CPU cores. And that's really where the end user can decide, is it something that's viable or really something that's needed for them or not? Let's talk A to 64 RAM speed, read, write, copy, not very good around the 50K mark. Uh, but the latency was a uh, 94.5 nanoseconds, I believe. And that is pretty good above average or like faster than average uh, for the latency. Seven bench R23, like, single threaded was 1860, I believe, which is still good, but not as good as what we've seen from Intel, which is pretty typical of Ryzen versus Intel. Apex Legends. On low settings, we're getting more than 165 hertz or 165 FPS for our 1% lows, which it makes it an optimal esports gaming experience. And in all, I'm not gonna say every esports game out there, but almost every esports game out there, with some exceptions like maybe Warzone uh, 2, you're gonna be able to get to the 165 hertz refresh rate for your average FPS at least with the full QHD resolution. So that's great. You're talking Fortnite, Valorant, Counter-Strike 2, all of those, you're definitely gonna be able to get to that 165 hertz refresh rate. Uh, though Counter-Strike 2, you might need to fiddle with the settings a little bit, uh, you know, put them on high or maybe very high instead of ultra um, to get that full FPS experience. Um, overall, Baldur's Gate 3 was a great experience at 150 FPS. Cyberpunk 2077, not so great. We had to do some tweaking, dropping ray tracing, dropping DLSS to balanced, and then bam, over 120 FPS, phenomenal. Uh, Dead Space, ultra settings, DLSS on quality, great experience, I think it was in the 70s. Uh, Dragon's Dogma 2, out in the wilderness, fighting stuff, I don't think is gonna be a problem mainly when you're in cities, high populated areas with NPCs. Goodness, that game is not optimized. And we saw some terrible 1% low stutters in Dragon's Dogma 2. Definitely a dev issue, dev optimization still needs to be done with that game. God of War. We were, I believe, in the 70s for uh, ultra settings, DLSS on quality, and uh, dropping graphic settings down to original, boosted us up over 100, I think in the 120 range, which is good, it's very good. For QHD gaming, it's gonna be a great experience. Helldivers 2, where you're averaging around 90 FPS on ultra settings with ultra render quality. Very good gaming experience, super smooth, consistent 1% lows, uh, no issues in Helldivers 2. Alluvium, a lot of stutters in the overworld, had to drop textures down to medium, Still need more game optimization from the devs in Alluvium. Uh, overall, game experience though, I expect after more optimization to be very good, even on Epic settings, except textures might need to be dropped down to medium or high. Hogwarts Legacy. We had some crashes, but we did mostly optimize it. I mean, it, it honestly, I kept stuttering even after the, some of the optimization that happened. Only 16 gigs of RAM is not quite enough for Hogwarts Legacy. I really recommend 32 gigs for that game specifically, unless you're wanting to play on lower settings. Um, just because there's so many NPCs and game assets, it tries to suck up like 24 gigs of DDR5 RAM. And uh, that 16 gigs just runs into a bottleneck causing stutters as things load in and out. Hogwarts Legacy otherwise should play quite, quite well once the 32 gig RAM sticks are installed. That would be my anticipation. Uh, more optimization would be required, probably medium settings, and then it would probably also play pretty well. But if you wanna play ultra, yeah, I just recommend getting more RAM if you can. Witcher 3, we were 70 FPS with frame gen, not quite enough in my opinion. Turning off ray tracing boosted us over 100 or close to 190 to 100 which gave us great overall gameplay experience with frame gen enabled. So definitely capable of playing the game once ray tracing is disabled. But as you can tell, as I went over all those different games, multiple game setting optimizations 
need to occur either turning off ray tracing or turning textures down are the two main things that'll boost your FPS and make this a great gaming laptop in the vast majority of games. Um, in terms of CPU performance, this thing is like the, I don't know if it's quite the king, but it's almost the king of CPU performance in the mid-range price segment. Very close to being the king, unofficial king, one of the top five laptops without a doubt in the mid-range CPU performance category. Um, there are some other contenders out there that have like the i9 chip, but the thing is, the i9-14900HX is just never gonna get 34,000 in Cinebench R23 unless you super undervolt it and like have really high power limits and all of that. This thing's getting 34K out of the box. And that's phenomenal, okay? It's one of the best laptops in the mid-range price segment. So for those of you that need multi-core rendering, great gaming laptop overall, not quite as colorful a display as I would like. Those are the kind of the two main things. Great CPU display, good, but not quite as colorful as I would love for like content creators. Like that's what I feel like this thing is gonna be great for. Um, but the lack of the display only being 100% sRGB instead of P3 just makes it harder to recommend to content creators. It's not, it's not quite perfect. And there's no SD card slot for content creators either. So it's close. It's still gonna be a pretty good laptop for content creators, but maybe not quite perfect. Last thing, battery life, don't expect much. It's a 16 core CPU. It's not gonna be very battery optimized. Like two to four hours, depending on what you're doing with it. It, is, it takes a lot of juice to run a 16 core CPU. Um, and if you really, really maximize it with like everything off, maybe you'll get five hours of idling or something, but it's not gonna ever be um, all day battery life, I don't think so, but it is a 90 watt hour battery on the inside. So that is nice, but it, yeah, just the, the 16 core 32 threads, it just takes a lot to run all those cores and threads. Overall, I can absolutely recommend this laptop. I don't see any major flaws with it. It just has pros and cons and it, it will fit some users really, really well. And some users, it will not quite fit them well enough. And there'll be other laptops maybe with better display quality or maybe better GPU performance, like an RTX 4080, for example but that costs more money. And those of us who don't have infinite money can appreciate saving some money and changing a couple settings and getting almost the identical experience. Those are the two main things about the laptop um, that make it good and bad. And it's overall, I think, very good for someone who wants CPU performance and an overall fairly portable package at a reasonable price point. And they're willing to fiddle with graphical settings to get the gameplay experience that they really want. Anyway, that's my review of the Asus Tough A16. I hope you enjoyed it. Please drop a like uh, and consider subscribing for more gaming laptop content and gaming content in general. Thank you so much. I'll see you in the next one. Brandon, out. Huzzah.